Good afternoon, and welcome to the third and final edition of the Institute of Policy Studies series of post-GE 2020 online forums. You recall that the first was held on the 1st of October when we shared our data from the IPS post-election survey 2020. Uh, the key takeaways from that forum was that when we looked at groups which are now clearly supportive of greater political diversity in Singapore, then in addition to the usual groups of young voters and voters in the higher socioeconomic classes, we found that there were more voters within the lower household income and those with only post-secondary education that felt that political competition is important in Singapore. Dr. Derek Dakuna, independent scholar who joined us then, said that nonetheless, Singaporeans were more likely to choose moderate opposition parties when they thought about providing that diversity in parliament. Dr. Lamping Er, scholar at the East Asian Institute, said that he could see a future in Singapore where we would not have a two-party system, but more likely a one-and-a-half-party system. Professor Chu Yunhan, who heads up something called the Asian Barometer Survey that tracks political attitudes of people in 14 Asian countries in the region, said that, like many other Asians, Singaporeans were more interested in democracy conceptualized as something that delivers good governance, that provides social equity, much more than the issue of political and civic rights and democratic norms and procedures. So with that, Dr. Derek Dukuna thought about the issues that he felt the PAP government that came back to power with a total popular vote of 61.2% should pay special attention to, yes, the perennials of cost of living, uh, as well as the uh, issue of CPF and uh, the issue of decaying HDB leases, but clearly also the question of the job situation, given that the likelihood of why low income uh, voters shifted their support from the PAP was because of the economic hardship they are facing in the midst of the COVID pandemic. The second forum that we held on the 8th of October focused on data that was derived from a survey on media use of voters during the 10th July uh, um, election and the hustings in the run-up to that special day. What they found was that not only was this, of course, the internet election because of the constraints of safe distancing during the pandemic, but there was actually less of a generational divide than we thought because the senior baby boomers were just as likely to use platforms of instant messaging to learn more about the parties and the candidates. The speakers who included not just my colleague, Dr. Carol Soon, but Associate Professor Chang Wei Yu, Dr. Natalie Pang, and Mr. Chua Chin Hon said that first, it may be very uh, crucial for parties going forward to do a few things. First, to really look at the use of Instagram, Telegram, and other instant messaging to uh, firmly close the generational gap in the use of social media in political campaigning. Second, that there should be greater use of social media, not just to put content out, but as Mr. Chua showed us, it is very important and a crucial resource in order to, uh, to, to actually analyze what you can gather through social media in order to uh, pick up the weak signals that uh, indicate to parties how their parties are performing through the hustings. Finally, uh, they celebrated the fact that the youth were using social media much more and engaging one another, educating one another on the issues. But their question was, how will the use of social media in this fashion uh, bring people together and use together? Or will it actually cause uh, a polarization as um, people gather within the echo chambers? What is it that will bring them out to speak to each other from camp to camp, uh, from uh, interest group to interest group? So here we are this afternoon uh, at the third forum, and I'm so pleased to present to you a forum with the parties on the vision and plans 
uh, going forward beyond GE 2020. This afternoon, we are very honored to have three panelists. The first is Ms. Rahayu Mazam. She is Member of Parliament in Jurong GRC. She is also Parliamentary Secretary at the Ministry of Health. We're so uh, glad that she can join us this afternoon and we welcome you, Ms. Rahayu Mazam. Second, we have Mr. Louis Chua, who is Member of Parliament in Sengkang GRC, which all of us will of course know, is the second group representation constituency that was wrested by the leading opposition party, Workers' Party, in GE 2020. We are very pleased to have him join us and uh, we'd love to hear more about what he has to say about the analysis of his party's performance and its future going forward in the 14th Parliament of Singapore. Finally, we have Mr. Francis Yen of the Progress Singapore Party. We're very pleased to have him with us. He's uh, um, like Mr. Louis Chua, first time uh, contender in a general election on the 10th of July. He stood in Chua Chukang GRC, and uh, he of course is now the Assistant Secretary General of PSP, a party that is clearly much uh, associated with Dr. Tan Cheng Bok, the Secretary General, who was formerly a party stalwart of the People's Action Party. So with that, I just want to welcome all of you, Ms. Ruhayu, uh, Mr. Chua, and Mrs. Yuan, uh, Mr. Yuan for joining us. And uh, I thought what we'd do is uh, really to uh, kick off with uh, three questions. Uh, I'll uh, you know, pose one and then let all three of you um, offer us your views and then go on to the next. So are you ready? Okay, first let's uh, start with Ruhayu. I think we agreed that we will refer to each other by our first names. So please also call me Jillian. Ruhayu, your party senior, uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong, offered an early postmortem on the People's Action Party's performance in GE 2020. He said that 61.2% uh, uh, vote share in GE 2020 was a clear mandate to govern. It was a strong outcome and it was certainly within the range of the party's expectations in terms of what it will gather in GE 2020. He also said that unlike some people's theories that it's the youth vote that swung away from the PAP, he recognized that there was uh, a shift in support among the 40 to 60 year olds, uh, probably because of the economic hardship that they were facing uh, during this COVID pandemic, in spite of the massive budgetary support that has been offered everyone to tie through this crisis of a generation. He also said that in its use of social media, while the PAP had put out as much content as it could, it would it has the challenge of connecting through the other platforms, including uh, the IM, the instant messaging platforms that was mentioned earlier. So Rohayu, I know it's been a while since, uh, we all know it's been a while since you gave that postmortem in, on the 18th of July. And I hope that with the benefit of um, a lot of analysis by our peers and also with the survey data and uh, discussion, even at these forums that I've mentioned, uh, can you give us uh, more of what the PAP's internal assessment of its performance in GE 2020 is uh, so that we can uh, have that as a good background for our discussion later? So over to you, Rohayu, please. Firstly, thank you very much, Jillian and IPS, for this opportunity to have a meaningful discussion on uh, the plans that the parties all have moving forward um, post-GE 2020. I would like to start by um, highlighting perhaps what our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Lee Seng Lung, uh, mentioned at the commencement of GE 2020. He actually said that it was never going to be an easy election. So we knew that coming in, as Singaporeans were experiencing great difficulties and um, had severe anxieties due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And despite the government's best efforts, the 
anxieties were strong and serious over jobs and livelihoods amongst Singaporeans. There had been concerns about cost of living, job opportunities for Singaporeans, and these issues were exacerbated um, during these times of crisis. And these were matters that we need to uh, face and address head on. Secondly, we were also up against a major trend that also had been around for some time, which is the desire to have a more diverse representation in Parliament, to have more diverse to have diversity of views and a debate on uh, policy alternatives. So these were things that um, we were up against. Um, we also need to acknowledge the growing and differing aspirations of people and their hopes and expectations. People want their jobs to be protected. They want the uh, vulnerable to be taken care of. They want equity. They want fairness. So we need to keep listening and accommodate this growing desire for diversity. We also at the same time strengthen the common cause that hold us together as Singaporeans. So I think um, as we reflect, um, there is room for us to definitely improve our communications and engagement with the people. We have to constantly find meaningful platforms to share with people the challenging trade-offs the government has to make, the differences in views on different matters, and we need to give more clarity on where the party stands on issues that matter to the young people and how we would support their aspirations. And we need to learn to do this in a digital space. So these are all the new things that we needed to keep up with, that we needed to learn and adjust and change. Um, but at the end, though, we are very grateful for the continued support of Singaporeans. We are heartened and humbled by the clear mandate given by the people. The GE 2020 experience actually reinforced um, the need to continue to work with Singaporeans, to continue to engage them and to stay true to our party values, which is to keep people at the heart of all our actions. Oh. Thank you for sharing that. I think you've emphasized that the policies are there, but you do want to improve on your outreach and communication and also to engage voters on the trade-offs in public policy. Um, so now maybe I could uh, give the time over to Mr. Chua. Um, Mr. Chua, what is the Workers' Party's internal assessment of the performance, your performance in GE 2020? What are the key takeaways or uh, lessons that you've learned from it. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so firstly, again, I would like to thank the Institute of Policy Studies for your kind invitation and for having us here at this forum. And it's my honor to speak to everyone this afternoon. So in terms of the important lessons our party has come to learn from GE 2020, I think first of all, the Workers' Party goes into each general election with the expectations of a hard battle so as what Ms. Rahayu mentioned, it's never going to be an easy one. And especially after G 2015, where you saw the national swing through the PAP, I think the Workers' Party um, actually went back to the grassroots with uh, renewed conviction and uh, determination to serve. So, you know, in a way, the work has already begun for the campaign since then. And we came into this GE in particular with our expectation very clear. Um, it was uh, an election in the midst of COVID-19. And in fact, many analysts out there were predicting a landslide of over 70% for the PAP. Some people have also mentioned that, uh, look, in a crisis environment, there will be always a flight to safety. So the risk of an opposition wipeout is real. And, but at the same time, we also believe that the hard work that we have put in and the vision for Singapore that we have. Um, and so it is up to Singaporeans to decide uh, whether they believe in a stronger elected opposition presence to bring a form of uh, greater checks and balance uh, to the incumbent. And that is also why we fought our campaign um, on the slogan of asking Singaporeans to make your vote count. So we were heartened by the warm reception um, and of course, we were also very fortunate to have um, the support of, um, of our party members, um, with, you know, Mr. Lau Tia Kiang, Mr. Peng Bin Huat, Mr. Chun Xiao Mao, um, who have you know, demonstrated to us um, you know, what it means to be a parliamentarian, to lead by example. Um, I think to answer your question more specifically, I would like to bring it down to three specific points, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but I think more generally, you know, for the Workers' Party, 
we have always been consistent in ensuring that we do not forget the fundamentals of listening to the ground, putting in the legwork, and having principled policy positions. Now, in terms of listening to the ground, um, I think earlier on in one of your sessions, there was a lot of um, discussions about the role of social media and the new media in this election. Um, and certainly in an increasingly very informed electorate, uh, it may be easy to assume that we only need to spend uh, more attention on the online sphere. Um, but to us, you know, it is very important to put our focus on the concerns of Singaporeans who may not be actively engaged in social media as well. So, you know, it's important to do our groundwork, um, be it going about our house visits, speaking to them at the coffee shops, uh, at the MRT stations, just to give us the assurance that we always have our feet firmly planted on the ground. And secondly, in terms of putting in the leg work, um, you know, it's about trying to do our best to listen to Singapore, as many Singaporeans as we can. Um, and this is where we are very thankful to um, you know, the volunteers that have always been putting in the hard work, uh, putting in the leg work to reach out to Singaporeans as best as we can to help us to build that rapport and understanding. And finally, on principal policy positions. Now, it is through the interactions on the ground that I've described earlier that my party colleagues and, and ourselves were able to really bring the voice of the concerns of the day to parliament, be it the debate on the um, reserve presidency in the past to right now the uh, discussions on the minimum wage. Um, you know, while we may not be able to convince the government of our views, I think um, you know, we also make the case clear to Singaporeans that um, you know, we, we are willing to voice out, um, bring a voice to our Singapore, fellow Singaporeans that's also based on sound reasoning. Um, so that's um, some of the key takeaways that we have. And um, over to you, Jillian. Okay. Thank you so much, Louis. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so you had three points, listening to the ground, uh, putting, uh, uh, you know, in the legwork. Uh, and I think your emphasis is on the retail politics that Dr. Derek Dakuna noted uh, in the first forum, um, going to the ground rather than just um, using social media and other techniques to kind of mediate uh, the interaction between yourself and uh, um, the people. Yeah, so thank you for that. It's, uh, your points are very clear. And now it's over to uh, Francis. Um, thanks for being so patient. Um, you know, you are part of uh, the, a, a new party that emerged for GE 2020. Um, so we are really anxious to hear from you. I think I should uh, point out to the audience that your party does have two members in parliament through the non-constituency member of parliament scheme. Uh, they stood in West Coast GRC, which was uh, uh, among the uh, closest margins for the opposition, uh, though not winning a seat. Um, the audience, you will understand that there is a provision on the system to ensure that there are at least 12 opposition members in parliament. And since the Workers' Party that, Ms. that Lewis is part of gained 10 seats, there was a shortfall of two. And uh, the two seats were offered to the contestants, the candidates from the opposition, PSP, in West Coast GRC. So uh, congratulations to uh, PSP uh, in being able to send uh, Ms. Hazel Kwa and Mr. Leong Waiman to Parliament as NCMPs. Um, so over to you um, uh, to share with us what the PSP's own internal assessment of GE 2020 has been. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dylan, for having uh, me on this show and uh, also uh, a very good afternoon to uh, all of you watching uh, this program. Uh, first of all, I think it's quite evident that uh, the last election year, all of us see a sea of change. And that is, uh, I think for Singapore is good news. Um, you know, we can't uh, keep status quo, we've got to progress with the time. And also um, uh, through some of the uh, survey, like uh, Black Box has given us quite a bit of credit for uh, causing the swing. Uh, we are flattered, but uh, we think there are more reason than just uh, uh, having a, a PSP there, but we are humble. Uh, same time, I mean, the, your uh, survey also uh, gave us credit for having the credibility uh, uh, recognition by 60% of your respondents. Uh, and that's also very encouraging. 
But as a party, we were disappointed. We were, it was like, uh, it's so close and yet so far. We almost uh, uh, won a jersey in, in our own right, but uh, we are not uh, deterred. At the same time, we are very encouraged uh, by the results, overall getting about 40% uh, as a new kids on the block. Uh, with hardly one year of uh, assistance, uh, it's no uh, easy feat. But we also got to credit it to uh, Dr. Tan, who actually pulled us through. I mean, it is like uh, our, our analysis, is, uh, I think Dr. Tan has a lot of credibility and I think the voters kind of give him the benefit of doubt that uh, he brings along a slate of candidates uh, who are credible. And indeed we have uh, quite uh, credible people uh, on the bench of, of candidates. And, and that is a very good start. And the challenge, of course, is to make sure that uh, we do not disappoint uh, the, the, our supporters that uh, give us this first so-called recognition and benefit of the doubt is for us to prove ourselves. So moving forward, I think there are a few uh, pointers that uh, is important uh, in, in our thinking. First of all, as uh, Rohayu pointed out, there is a shift uh, uh, is a rising uh, group of the younger voters who is clearly um, uh, uh, in favor of plurality, diversity, you know, uh, no monopoly of one particular party, and particularly free contest of ideas, and also a level playing field. I think from the context of Singapore, I think this is good uh, to have such thinking and such awakening. And uh, if we continue along the path, this the group of voters is going to be a plus for alternative party. And it is the duty of the alternative parties to put themselves to actually get the support of these voters. They are also the group that are being <clears throat> uh, affected by the hot button issues, whether it be because of the COVID environment. And uh, it will, uh, things like employment, you know, cost of living and all the hardship going through. And on top of that, having an election during a, cri uh, during a pandemic crisis uh, do upset a lot of people. Uh, and that kind of uh, did not prove that uh, uh, people do uh, go on the flight for safety in a, in, a, in a pandemic, in a crisis situation. So if we go forward to look at the next election, and by the way, we are already preparing for the next election immediately after the last one, uh, because we can't sit back and relax and wait for the next one to come and start to work. But moving forward, going to the next election, I think these three factors, the very first factor we talked about, the changing trend of the view, um, I think it's going to stay. Uh, hopefully it's not just because of the, of the crisis that people start to awaken. Uh, people want change and people want diversity and people do want, you know, uh, plurality. Um, what will be the hot button issues then? in four years time, uh, there will always be. And I think it is important for PSP to prove that we have the caliber to constructively, constructively provide answers, also alternative it. And thirdly, whether it's going to be a crisis when we have election, nobody knows. But we're going to work to make sure that we tackle these two elements of the changing trend of people and win over those voters who are still uh, conservative in your survey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Thanks for uh, taking us through, um, you know, what your party is going, uh, sort of assessing for itself. And you mentioned that the party is disappointed, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not daunted. And uh, you said that you'll continue to work very hard. There is a trend uh, within the demographics that you want to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, but you, on the other hand, are also looking to feel credible candidates. So I think this leads us very nicely into our second question. And I hope it'll be a rapid round uh, um, of answers. Uh, the second question is really, uh, you know, uh, indeed, about building party strength. Um, so what can you tell us uh, about your party and what it's doing in terms of building up its internal capacity? I think you all cited some points there, uh, building up its internal capacity and also its support base. Um, you know, uh, over the next, the course of the next three, four, five years um, before the next election. So internal strength and also party support. Uh, Rohayu, would you like to go first? Sure. Just um, quick thoughts, please. Yeah, indeed. On um, building internal strength, I think as a party, we need to acknowledge 
uh, the gaps and our shortcomings um, and where we can do better. We're going through our after action review and we're looking at areas where we can improve. Uh, this includes our communication strategy, our engagement in social media, and we definitely need to build up our capacity on this. But at the same time, I think we can also build on existing strengths because we actually have very hardworking, dedicated activists who care very much for the residents and their fellow Singaporeans. So we need to continue to leverage on them to get their inputs on feedback on the ground and continue to empower them so that they can also do the necessary outreach um, and also help um, us in supporting Singaporeans. Um, this leads me to engagement um, and on engaging voters, I think we need to continually uh, create platforms for meaningful engagement to build trust, to show openness and accountability and we need to allow for space for people to share ideas and actually show how those ideas can be translated to tangible shifts in policies. Mm -hmm. um, we should also let people hear from each other because engagement is not just a one-way process. It's not just a process where you, know, you have a group of people just listing um, their wish lists to the government and have the government uh, deliver those, right? Because policy making is rarely so straightforward. They're usually differing views. And so it's all important for all of us to have a meaningful discourse. Uh, but the challenge is in this is to ensure that we do not create polarization within the society. And we've seen how this could play out in other countries. So we need to find a Singaporean way of doing this. Um, I am hopeful because um, as a people, we are generally respectful. We're respectful of the process. We're respectful of each other. And most of us want the best for Singapore. So I think in terms of engagement, these are things that we can continue to build on. Thank you, Rohayu. How about you, Louis? What do you have to say about building party strength and uh, engaging the um, support base and uh, expanding it even. Mm. Thanks, Jillian. So I think the first thing to note is that for the Workers' Party, we are very much volunteer-driven. Um, we do not have full-time professionals to support us in terms of our policy development. And even if you look at the office of the leader of the opposition with the three additional legislative assistants, I think that is necessarily a part-time position. Uh, we do not have the resources of the public service to support us. Um, so that being said, I think, you know, really it just begins with um, organizing to our strengths right now. I think um, our Secretary, Secretary General, Mr. Pritam Singh, has mentioned that, um, you know, at least right now in terms of having 10 MPs in Parliament, while we not, may not be able to shadow every ministry, um, we are organizing ourselves into the five broad areas. Um, you know, firstly, health, aging and retirement adequacy, um, jobs, business and the economy, education, inequality and the cost of living, housing, transport and infrastructure, and lastly, national sustainability. So we will organize ourselves along these um, five broad topics. Um, but I think we are also very thankful that we saw more Singaporeans stepping up after the GE to help um, as a volunteer in their personal capacities. And, you know, this is something that we very much are very thankful for. And we continue to rely on a very dedicated team of volunteers to serve the residents as best as they can. Um, and this is something which, you know, we urge um, you know, fe our fellow Singaporeans to do step forward um, so that we can help to engage Singaporeans better. And I think this forum that we have today, uh, this IPS forum, is one of the means by which um, ourselves as the Workers' Party, as well as the other parties here, will be able to put forth our views um, to engage um, with a wider audience. But again, bringing back to my uh, the points that I made at the, uh, during in the first question, it mm -hmm. is also about reaching out um, you know, on a face-to-face -face visit uh, basis via your house visits, estate walks, uh, social media, etc. So we will continue to build on that. Of course. Louis, what is very special about WP is that uh, over the course of uh, maybe two decades, you've been very systematic as a party in developing your support base, but only in a certain part of the island. And uh, um, so I don't know whether you want to quick, give a quick response in terms of um, building up the party, whether you're still going to be um, looking at building up support in the areas that are contiguous to your, uh, the, the grounds that you currently hold or would you expand beyond that area? Well, I think if you, as you mentioned, we take a systematic view of this. And again, coming back to my point about um, availability of resources, 
Yeah. Um, you know, we are very much volunteer driven. And even right now, when we say that we have 10 members of parliament uh, in, in parliament, um, really, we, we just moved from having six MPs and three NC MPs, a total of nine in the last um, parliament to 10 MPs right now. So we will continue to take progressive steps um, to, to build out uh, our presence. And I think the most important step right now, it's really to you know, organize, our, organize our strengths, continue to demonstrate to Singaporeans in terms of the value that we bring to parliament, the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And um, we will come the next general elections. Let's see how things go. Okay. Uh, you, you'll see why it was important for me to ask you that, because uh, now we go to Francis, and uh, we noticed that uh, um, Francis, while the, I, the notion initially was that the PSP would confine itself to the western half of the island, uh, that uh, you did nonetheless also contest in Yochu Kang. So could you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the PSP's plans in building up? the party, given that you're new, you're young, but you are um, certainly very committed, uh, as you shared just now, uh, to the cause. Um, Tell us a little bit more about uh, how you're going to build up your support base and whether you actually do have, um, perhaps not so much a geographical strategy, but uh, Lewis was saying, you know, you actually do want to do it systematically. What is your game plan? And I suppose uh, it'll cut into how opposition parties are planning uh, their strategies as well. Sorry to lay all of that down on your shoulders, Francis. But Thank it's you very much. So I'm going to reveal party secret to you now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think it's um, a no, no secret. Basically, we are uh, taking a three-pronged approach. It's very clear. Uh, we, we say we are disappointed, but we are glad that we have this opportunity now with two NCMP, Manwai and uh, Hazel in, in Parliament, and we have our so-called foothold now on uh, four GRCs and uh, the three uh, SMCs. The strategy, basically the plan is very straightforward. First, we want our two NCMP to be our flag, our branding in parliament uh, so that people can see through them what the party stands for and uh, what kind of party we are. I think so far they have done a, a great job, I, I believe, and they have very good feedback. Uh, from from the ground that uh, we are moderate, we are responsible in our views, and we are we are constructive. Um, so I think that is the important thing that we want to establish a brand. Secondly, is we are in the throes of uh, restructuring. It's very important they have a good structure for the party. We only are a one year old uh, party, just over a year old. Uh, the restructuring organization, the organization structure has been completed. We are putting leaders in place, and as we speak. Uh, uh, thanks to the result of the uh, G2 uh, 2020, we are attracting a lot of good talent joining us. I mean, young talent is young as just graduating undergrad. And this is good news because it gives us an opportunity to now groom talent uh, for, as we talk, we're really talking about renewal, you know, bringing the, the, the talents to the party. And the, the, the structure of the party would have two phases. One is on the ground. I mean, as everybody uh, just alluded, and you know, Ryu and uh, Lewis, you know, all parties need to work the ground. Uh, there's uh, no shortcut to it. We have to win the heart and mind of the people. And um, the party that does best wins, right? So we, um, uh, I'm not going to go into detail how we're going to do it, but we have a plan to make sure that uh, various in- innovative ideas are, are being thought out. Uh, you'll see it as the months come, come by. And of course, at the HQ level, uh, we have also strengthened ourselves. I mean, uh, you probably would have heard about the youth wing, the wo- women's wing. Um, we we're large enough even to create that. Uh, we're taking a lot of traction. And we are also very conscious of the fact that the coming next election is going to be fought, not uh, as usual, on the cyberspace. And uh, it's going to be even probably much more technically advanced. Um, four years from now, technology will have changed, you know, uh, you will have new media platform to go on uh, to reach out to the people. So uh, we have also gained a lot of attraction, building a strong core of people to do that. Um, so it is an um, integrated strategy to make sure that we have the structure, the people. And now, as we speak, we are going to build the soul of the party, meaning that we want everybody to know what the party stands for, what our policy stand, which I'm going to share a bit and the next question, yeah. and, uh, and move forward. But the, the, the crux of it is that it's going to be a party 
center on compassion, center on working for a country, for people. And we want everybody to come in in the leadership. First priority, a heart in the right place. Thanks. Thank you, Francis. Well, let me go to the third question very quickly. Um, and here, let me give Francis the heads up uh, on, on um, policy. Uh, Rachel Wu on Facebook, thank you for your question. Francis, this is posed to you. What are the mechanics of the PSP's living wage policy? On one hand, the PSP says that it wants to lower business costs, but it also wants to raise wages. So that's the heads up for you. Uh, we haven't had any policy-oriented question for you yet, Rahayu, but uh, as I promised, the third question is about the key policy planks that your party would like to develop much further that's special for the 14th parliament. Uh, Rohayu, say something about that and uh, maybe that might also provoke uh, some good questions and comments uh, uh, from our audience out there uh, on the issue of public policy agenda. Sure. I would categorize this um, agenda into two broad buckets. One bucket deals with the immediate needs and concerns of Singaporeans and the next bucket deals with the concerns moving forward. Because one key area that we are looking at and will continue to have to deal with will be issues surrounding the challenges Singaporeans are facing in this COVID-19 pandemic. There are immediate and real economic stress that a substantial number of Singaporeans are facing and we have to deal with this. With the PAP as the government of the day has rolled out multiple budgets to provide immediate relief to workers, to businesses, to households, and we will continue to keep looking at keeping Singaporeans safe, healthy, and ensuring meaningful employment by opening up the, econom the economy progressively and safely, and ensuring those that need support will continue to get support. I think just to show some of the things that the PAP government has done includes the um, fact that Singapore is one of the first few countries to submit an expression of interest to join the COVID-19 vaccine global access to COVAX facility in June. Uh, this is a multilateral initiative that will ensure that the Republic gets access to vaccination, vaccine when they are safe and effective vaccines are available. We've also uh, put in close to $100 billion of funds um, dedicated to Singaporeans through um, channels through various schemes and initiatives like the job support scheme, the gro jobs, jobs growth incentive, where employers, especially SMEs, are supported so that they can retain jobs um, for Singaporeans. And there are also more direct support through solidarity payments, through the COVID-19 support grant and the workfare special payment. We've also looked at uh, creating the SG United Jobs and Skills Package, which aims to help around 100,000 Singaporeans to access immediate short-term as well as longer-term job opportunities or pick up job-related skills and capabilities so that when the economy picks up, we are at a better place to move forward. So these are just some of the examples of the more immediate actions that we have to take. But there is a long tail to this um, and we have to probably deal with these effects for a long time. But the other key plank is really to look at how to continually improve the lives of Singaporeans beyond this pandemic. And this relates to issues that are perennial, healthcare, education, housing, infrastructure, as well as addressing the evolving aspirations of Singaporeans and that desire for more diversity, um, the desire for fairness, equity, and for issues relating to basic needs like healthcare, housing, we will continue to work um, through the different ministries in consultation with the public to improve policies, adjust schemes um, in place so that the support is there, support is needed. For issues that are a bit more um, on the softer side, issues that um, touch on society's norms and values, we have to create broader platforms uh, for conversations and avenues for follow-up actions. An example of this would be the Conversations for Women's Development that I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. um, the aim is to allow people to be involved in the process um, of not just changing legislation, but also norms that lie at the core of the very issue. And we've seen many other opportunities for conversations and call to action, like um, the Youth Action Challenge, where youth are encouraged and supported to find solutions to the community's problems. We've had the Emerging Stronger Conversations, mm -hmm. and we've also set up the Singapore Together Action Networks to bring together Singaporeans and community partners across different sectors to translate ideas into solutions. So these are the things that we will continue to look at. 
and we'll continue to spare no effort to ensure that Singapore remains a home with opportunities for all, where successive generations of Singaporeans can have good jobs, can fulfill their aspirations and improve their lives um, right. uh, as we grow in tandem, you know, as we recover and grow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rohayu. Can't think of a better person to lead the uh, initiative on gender equality, of course, than your good self. Um, you know, knowing your profession as well uh, and uh, the many things you're doing um, on the ground in terms of social services. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, and uh, I, I think I better quickly cut to Lewis and uh, pose you the same question. Uh, bear in mind that there is a, a question from Facebook Live by Eden Kai Tan. And uh, her simple question is, what is your opinion on minimum wage? Um, the less simple questions are to do with whether uh, there is actually consensus within WP about how soon or how fast you would want to see the introduction of a minimum wage, which is what your party has been advocating. Uh, of course, this is vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, uh, the government's model of progressive uh, wage model, right? So um, that's that's a question uh, posed here by uh, Elena Poe, um, who said, why is, uh, you know, I think it's Elena Poe, but there's some, it's taken off now, I can't track it. But uh, basically it's a question of whether there is consensus, not just around the minimum wage policy, which has been on your manifesto twice over now, um, but you know, uh, how, how quickly and how uh, fast and hard do you want to go? So over to you, Louis. Mm. Thanks for the question, Jillian and uh, Elena. Maybe before I talk about the broader policy agenda, maybe I'll just address this question first. And the very short and straightforward answer is that we do want to implement it right now. Um, we, str we strongly believe in the minimum wage. Um, that's something that we have put forth in our manifesto. Um, and that is something which we, you know, we have also debated quite rigor rigorously in parliament over the last one to two months. Um, clearly, uh, it is something which we, you know, a lot of people speak of the minimum wage and the progressive wage model as though they are diametrically opposed concepts. But um, really, it's one where we do not necessarily uh, oppose the progressive wage model. It is one where, yes, we recognize that um, that is a model that has been rolled out for a couple of sectors. But we also recognize at the same time that there is a significant number of Singaporeans who has fall, fallen through the cracks and may not be beneficiaries of this. So what we are proposing for is actually a minimum wage of $1,300. And meanwhile, as we roll out the progressive wage model for more sectors so that you know, it is about people's lives, uh, it is about people having to feed their family at this point in time and not having to you know, wait for this to be rolled out to their particular sector. So I think that's the, the direct, direct answer to the question over there. Um, and in terms of the public policy agenda, Jillian, um, again, if we bring it back to um, what um, our Secretary General, Mr. Pritam Singh has mentioned, I think brought, um, and, and also rec in recognition to, to what uh, Ms. Rahayu has mentioned, I think there's no es escaping the fact that at this point in time, it really is about the economic impact from COVID-19 um, on people's livelihoods, on, pe on their jobs, on the economy. So this is something that is top of mind. And we have, of course, spent uh, quite a bit of time in Parliament to discuss that. And as long as the pandemic continues to affect not just Singapore, but the rest of the world, I think the national conversation around this will continue to, uh, to revolve around the pandemic and emerging from it um, in a post-COVID-19 world. Now, having said that, I think, uh, yes, yeah, so going back to the broader principles, um, the Workers' Party do agree with the government um, when we have to, and we disagree um, where we disagree with, uh, with the points that are made by the government. But ultimately, it's really about achieving the best outcome for Singapore and Singaporeans. And of course, when it comes to a national pandemic like, such as COVID-19, I think you know, it's, you know, politics has to take a back seat. It's about unity of purpose to ensure that um, Singaporeans and Singapore moves forward. And so um, if we think about you know, how we are going to you know, promote the 
public policy agenda, how are we going to achieve our purpose there? Um, I think it's also driven by the available information that we have. Um, so this is something which I think Pritam has also mentioned in terms of the quantity and quality of information that is shared um, by the government to parliament, to the office of the leader of the opposition, um, and also the amount of um, basically the, the basically the willingness of the government to listen to and implement to to these um, alternative ideas. Um, so you know we, we've talked at length of the minimum wage, but at the same time, you know there are several other policy um, proposals that we have put forth in our manifesto. Uh, those are some of the things that we are going to pursue, be it the uh, redundancy insurance, HDB reform, etc. So in short. Um, for us, it's really not about opposing for the sake of opposing, but um, to basically have a reasoned conversation in Parliament on various policy matters going forward. Thank you for that, Louis. Uh, now it's over to Francis. I, I it, you know, I, I think there was a question posed about um, business costs at the end of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. So viability for everyone. Um, I didn't press you on that question, Louis. Uh, wasn't targeted to you, but maybe you want to bear that in mind in case any. Um, um, of our members of audience uh, from the business sector and uh, really want to ask, uh, you know, how you balance up those interests, right? But uh, since it was thrown to Francis, okay, uh, it's over to you. How do you uh, square the circle? Okay, uh, let me just uh, deal with the, the policy uh, question first and then I'll, okay. I'll come along, we'll pass by that uh, particular question. And I'd like to uh, give the uh, viewers a snapshot, pictorial snapshot of our policy uh, thinking so that you can register in your mind. Can I have the first slide, please? The first slide. Okay. It's the vision of the country, our vision that drives our views or our policies. So basically, essentially, we're saying that we want us to build a strong and united Singapore based on our pledge, the tenet of our pledge. That is a given. We're doing it today, a bit for years. But what we're saying is that there must be emphasis on what we want to do. So essentially, these are things like equitable share, uh, a prosperity. Prosperity must be for all. It's not only for class of people. Success defined beyond material success. A meritocracy over elitism, strength in governance, interest of our people above all else, and making a compassion our core national value, and freedom of expression and the diversity of ideas. That is the background of a vision that PSP has. The next slide, please. And with that, we have a set of some beliefs that you call planks. Good governance. We will champion all this kind of belief in parliament, inside and outside. Good governance means accountability. Leaders must be accountable for what they do. Set an example. Accountability, transparency, and independence are the fundamental of good governance of any good company, let alone a country. It is very important. There must be no conflict of interest and policies are better, must be better communicated to the public. So that is where it will drive our thinking on this plan of good governance. Then we have another cluster of policies that I think Louis and Rahayu alluded to. It's all under better livelihood. Every party will want to drive better livelihood for, for the people. What, what do we mean by that? So we are saying that for instance, under better livelihood, we will make sure that public services should not be run for profit. It is a public service. This is a very clear uh, uh, stand that we have. You know, affordable housing. When you say affordable, we, we mean really, truly affordable housing. Because all these are driven that affect the last bullet that means adequate retirement funding. Cost of living, housing, healthcare soaked up a lot of the CPF savings. So if that is freed up with more creative ideas, our people will have more money to retire. And a lot of problems can be solved without all the different packages here and there. Uh, it's like a patchwork uh, solution. So um, next slide, please. So we, we also value and engage society. We talk about it, you know, basically promote responsible freedom of expression. We must not live in a climate of fear. Basically, we want to make information more accessible because ideas and talent no longer is a monopoly, monopoly of one party. You have got a lot of talent as proven in the last election, both in parliament and outside parliament. So Singapore will benefit from having good fertilization of ideas and a free debate of ideas and let it have a free flow of ideas so the problem can be solved collectively by all. It's more really 
consultative style with the people. That's what we stand for. And we also believe very important in the transformation of economy because we are saying that the SME are our backbone. There are 250,000 SMEs and we need a good ecosystem to support them so that they can grow in entrepreneurship and enterpriseship, not only in Singapore, but spread beyond, establish our external wing, collaborate with GLCs. And at the same time with that, the end result will be more jobs for our people. And then we have to play the part of grooming our core. So the government should be less of a directive intervention, but more supportive and actually hands off to let entrepreneurship grow. Um, and the foreign workforce question we've been talking about, PMET, I want to make it very clear that PSV contention really is we are not against foreign talent. Foreign talent is needed to complement, to serve as a catalyst, but foreign talent should not be here to replace local talent when local talent can do the job. Uh, and that's a very important distinction. And the last two that I quickly will go through, one is really, uh, oh, sorry, the, before I go on, there's a minimum wage, uh, minimum living wage. That alluded to the question I will quickly answer. Yes. Wages is not really the only component of business cost. I speak with my own experience as a CEO of a company and running multinational. My KPI is to drive productivity 5% every year. So 2.5% at the national level is not really an achievement. 5% every year, which means you have to be more productive so that the objective is to make sure that your employees get better wages from the profit shared with them. So we our mindset to change to don't think of just wages as the main cost of business. As we all know, rental and everything else, you know, even the cost of electricity power is part of the cost. You know, putting on an aircon in the office is part of the cost of business. So there are a lot of areas that productivity can be enhanced. And if you are too mindset about that, and then we debate about the 32,000 people who earn less than uh, 1,003 a month, it is not meaningful. I think we should take a bigger look step back and think how creatively we could make life better for the lower wage people. And don't be over concentrated on just wage as business cost it is not. So holistic education, next slide please. Uh, it's, it's basically in summary, we just want to develop a more resilient Singaporean and that starts with education. We should not be training Singaporean on just hard skill early in life. They should be trained to build up character, build up compassion, build the values so that they grow up to be meaningful human being and not one to just know how to do the bad mess and the science, but lose basically compassion and meaning. And we cannot build a gracious society without that soft uh, uh, education. Okay, the last slide really is uh, everybody supports that and we too, environmental production and sustainability. We have to be global citizen responsible. We got to support uh, climate change, I mean, uh, carbon emissions and so forth. I think I just want to emphasize on the population. Population must be carefully managed, especially in Singapore, because it has got a lot of implication in terms of social infrastructure and, and the rest of the, uh, the factors affecting our lives. So it, our growth of population must be managed and we must, must make sure that building new citizens, bringing a PR must be properly so-called manage in terms of the criteria to bring them through, the right people are, are absorbed and actually being integrated with society. So I think this will form the basis, the fundamental that will drive what Manwai and Hazel were talking about in parliament at the same time outside for us to keep on in developing our policy to present a clear picture of what PSC stands for. Thank you. Thank you so much for going through uh, your policy agenda, Francis. I think uh, we can now uh, fully go get into all the questions and comments that have been sent through Facebook. Uh, um, thank you, audience, and uh, keep them coming. So let me just go somewhat systematically and uh, cast the first question to Rahayu. Um, taking off from where Francis ended his points, uh, Sloth Long has uh, posed um, a question to you. She says, um, is there a better way in which to uh, um, more tightly manage the inflow of foreigners into Singapore? Will there more, be more restrictions in place for, uh, she says, PREPSP issuance? Um, and she suggests that uh, uh, these may be tied more closely to people who seem to have some 
link to Singapore? Well, that's her question. Um, I guess uh, there is also, uh, you know, the sort of more permanent question of, of uh, migration into Singapore. And that might be um, where that connection to Singapore might come in. But I suppose there'll be other, um, you know, forms of migrant workers who don't have any prior linkage where this may be difficult. And you might uh, say a little bit about what's already in place in terms of the fair consideration framework that market tests the need for foreigners in Singapore and whether there is a scope for uh, refining of that. That's uh, one key question from Sloth Long uh, for you, Rohayu. And uh, I guess you can pick up from what the other panelists have been saying about uh, um, workforce issues. Over to you. Thank you very much, Jilin. Um, clearly, the issues surrounding work, job opportunities, are, um, something, it's something that is seized in the minds of Singaporeans right now, especially during difficult times like this. But I think we do need to step back and appreciate and understand how Singapore works um, as a nation. Um, and I think we've gone through this discussion a lot of times. The fact that Singapore is a small red dot and very dependent on um, its human capital, largely. Um, it has to build that, strengthen that, um, and actually um, make sure that we have all the necessary support, the necessary um, um, knowledge and skill to be able to build our economy. I think, um, as our other speakers has mentioned, I think uh, Francis has also highlighted that we're not opposed to, um, or generally Singaporeans are not opposed to having Singaporeans, um, uh, foreigners in, because we realise the importance of actually bringing in um, foreign talent where it is needed. Our markets in certain areas are still very new, still needs to be developed, still needs to be supported. And you have actually large groups, um, not just the MNCs, but also um, the SMEs, depending on some of these talents in building their businesses. Um, actually, the reality is I just had a house visit recently and um, one of my residents who is in the HR was on the contrary giving her a view about how we're being so difficult <laughs> allowing um, um, her to get her EP for one of her colleagues because um, of the current constraints. So it is a balance, clearly, something that we need to bring in. Because I think the, the fact remains that we do need to have injection of foreign talent to help build our economy. The thinking to that is to ensure that there's transference of knowledge, transference of information, so that we can strengthen the Singapore core, so that we have the necessary skills and resources, and we can continue to then build on what we have learned from them. Mm -hmm. But this process continues to be iterative because it is also about Singapore being open. It is the message and signal that we send to other countries. If we make everything so tight and difficult, um, it is not something that will be attractive because companies have a lot of other options in Asia now, especially. They can just cast their eye elsewhere and we could very easily lose opportunities which could very well mean jobs and meaningful um, opportunities for our own people, for Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. So That's I true. think in, in that respect, we definitely have to consider um, the nuance of approach. Um, and I, I'm glad that you kind of touched on the nuance of that because we also then have to look at what is the lived reality of our people, right? Why mm -hmm. does this feedback come about? Because perhaps at workplaces, this is what they're experiencing. They're seeing um, their um, peers who appear to be the same and stepping up or be given opportunities um, that they should like uh, rightly deserve. Mm -hmm. And they're foreigners. And so this causes unhappiness um, and this causes dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think the government needs to definitely zoom in and really correct. And that's right. We, we do have um, the fair uh, consideration framework put in place to ensure that there is no discrimination, that companies are fair in um, providing that opportunities, that our um, Singaporeans are not shortchanged or glossed over when there are opportunities that they very well deserve and could very well take. So MOM has actually been very, very firm and strong on this. Okay. Um, and it's actually looking um, at that aspect. Um, so this is something that is work in progress. And I actually call on Singaporeans to 
have that positive attitude, I think we realize the need to have support from foreign talent to build our economy. Yeah. But at the same time, where there are um, instances or events or, or um, situations where you know there is doubt as to whether or not um, there is fairness, mm-hmm. raise it, bring it up to MOM. I personally also had raised one issue. One of my residents felt that it was very unfair. I put it up to MOM and they immediately looked into it investigated it and that's the way we should do right we shouldn't just talk about it let's do something about it and deal with specific instances Mm -hmm. but at the same time we cannot be closed when there is a problem when there's a discrimination deal with it but as a matter of um, being inclusive as a matter of being open as an economy we should maintain that Um, and I think you rightly pointed out the nuances of um, also migrants coming to work and also those coming to stay and having families the reality is we have a lot of Singaporeans who are also marrying people from overseas. They want to have their family members be Singaporeans as well, you know, and actually live with them, have that comfort and uh, security of citizenship. So this is something that we also have to understand and nuance because there are many different views and many different desires from amongst our Singaporeans. So I guess I'll stop there, but I think it's not so straightforward as just putting a rule and set it in place and controlling. But what are the needs and what are the desires of Singaporeans? Okay. Thank you so much, Rahayu, for addressing that. I wonder if Louis and Francis want to say a few words more on this topic. Uh, yeah, over to Louis first. Uh, looks like you're gearing up to contribute something. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that, look, um, I, I do believe that Singaporeans are not inherently xenophobic phobic or against foreigners. And I would agree with Ms. Rahayu's point about how, you know, in Singapore, we definitely do have to build our human capital, um, develop Singaporeans. But I think the, um, the, the crux really is also that um, a lot of times we speak about a skills gap, a skill shortage, which we require foreigners to so-called top up. Um, and I think if we just take a step back and look at the, the workforce that we have, um, if you look at our education system, we have one of the, um, amongst the best education systems, um, you know, we have universities that are ranked at the top uh, of the um, university ranking tables, um, we have an educated workforce, then we do have to also, you know, wonder what is it that, you know, is lacking such that um, Singaporeans end up not having this so-called necessary skill sets um, to, to actually perform some of these roles. Yeah. And I think while there may be the fair consideration framework, which will be very helpful, I think we will also perhaps need to take one step for, forward and think about how to ensure that there is this skills transfer or niche skills to ensure that um, Singaporeans will be able to step up to these roles. Um, I think in the last um, parliamentary debate, uh, I think there was earlier this month, my colleague talked about having limited term foreign work passes tied to the training of Singaporeans. I think that's um, just one idea that I, yeah, that he, he spoke about to ensure that um, there is a certain uh, pressure, so to speak, to ensure that Singaporeans um, are being prepared for these roles. I think last month as well, um, I think I, I asked a question about the finance industry, which I guess a lot of you would know that I'm in. Yeah. where the proportion of Singaporeans in senior leadership roles, I think that has remained stable over the, the past years, uh, despite us being a financial um, hub for quite a while. How then do we you know, enable more Singaporeans to step into these roles um, and make sure that you know, we are equipped with the right skills and given the opportunity in the first place to step into these roles? I think this is something which we need to continue to, to work on as well. Okay. Thank you, Louis. Uh, back to you, Francis. A real quick one. Uh, you did say mm-hmm. that uh, wages are only a small part of business costs, and uh, you said that uh, it's time to um, make a definitive effort to um, raise productivity. This is not um, anything new to the PAP. It's been trying this since 1970s. Uh, remember the uh, productivity B. So what is it uh, that you might want to offer? Uh, which would uh, raise productivity and uh, make up for the um, foreign workers we'd rather not have in certain segments. Of course, we're not talking about the higher level where there's a clear transfer of skills, knowledge that we don't already have, uh, and also probably the connections, right, for business. And then you used to head up, um, you know, a string of MNCs. So uh, 
tell us what's your magic bullet. Yeah, maybe I could share it from my own perspective of uh, my business experiences um, <clears throat> hitting uh, global companies like Honeywell, Inga Soran, and uh, Hong Leong, so on so forth. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, labor is not a small part. It's one of the component of, of cost. So, so don't mistake me to say labor is not a cost. It is a cost, but not the only component. There are many components of cost, and of course, different companies have different profile. You are labor intensive, you are higher part. If you are capital intensive, you are lower part of the cost. Having said that, I think to the question I think Louis uh, alluded to it, you know, we, we do need uh, talent that we do not have, and we also need talent, real talent, that come into cost fertilized ideas. So, so our own talent can be challenged to improve to a different level. But it should not be a system where foreign workers are brought in because they are cheap and therefore it's expedient for a business to lower their costs uh, based on the fact that they're cheaper to employ. And that, that is the wrong basis. And I also believe that it's also good to use carrot and the stick. You see, in my own experience, when I was overseas running uh, Honeywell, you know, as the president for, for Asia, all the way from Korea to Australia to India, one of the principal factors is localization. The government didn't tell us to localize. We make it a point to, to, to localize all the position, including myself, down after the third round of being the CEO. The VPs, the directors are all being trained consciously. Why? Because there is a driving factor for the company to do it. You don't have to tell them because it's costly to keep on employing foreign, foreigners who are not passing down the, the, the skill to the next level. So we have to think about how to incentivize companies to localize, okay? And, and therefore it is better to have that, don't try to police and, and every company to make sure that they, they transfer skill and localize. So it's better to use the carrot and the stick. Of course, it's easier, easier said than done, but if you take that approach maybe and put a mind together that is where, and there's a lot of examples of other companies, how they do it, other countries. Um, of course, there's also this tension between making it attractive for companies to come in and therefore they want to stay because of the, of the cheaper cost of business there and expensive to stay because if you, if you, uh, if you localize, your, your labor cost is high. So I would therefore say that one localization should be made so-called an incentive by the company to do it. Secondly, on productivity, Really, if you drive productivity and have a conscious mindset to drive it, and a lot of foreign companies drive it because there's this mentality of continuous improvement. You know, we drive continuous improvement. I mean, it's a similar things that we, in the old days, the wits and all that kind, you know, the combined system. And now big companies are about the green belt, the black belt, you know, the Six Sigma concept. If we drive, have that kind of mentality, then people themselves, workers themselves come forward to make things, to, to, to make the processes much more efficient. You know, work can be done by three person, can be much more work can be done by three person, or three person work can be done by two. And as a result, we, you save costs and the cost can be passed down to make sure that, you know, the workers get the share of a higher wage and morale goes up. So that we want to think out of the box uh, from the business perspective, how do we improve productivity and not just focus so much on just a low wage, uh, and then the low wage will cost, you know, increase wage will cost higher cost, and therefore we said, no, don't do it because it will chase everybody away. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is not really true. It's not chasing everybody away. You've got to be more creative in the solution. Julian, if I may just add on to the yes. conversations, because I think these are meaningful things that uh, Francis and Louis have um, spoken about. Um, I think one in terms of productivity, I completely agree with Francis. This is the mindset that we need to get our companies into, right? Um, because they really need to look at how they can be more efficient. And which was why we actually embarked on the industry transformation maps, the trans industry transformation exercise, um, because it's very sectoral dependent, right? Uh, different sectors. Um, do it differently and needs to look at it differently. A lot of pressures from different segments, including the workers themselves, um, that fear of change. Um, and so these are things that we need to continue building on. So definitely we need to encourage this. But um, there is, there has been a little bit of inertia on the part of the companies because it's not easy changing. Um, so 
what the government does is really give um, incentives with productivity grants, with um, you know, uh, uh, tax uh, rebates to allow for them to invest on these. Uh, but it's still work in progress and I think we need to continue to encourage it. Okay. Um, and on um, the... Um, the sort of lever, uh, levers sort of to, to make sure that companies actually hire local and uh, really transfer, make sure that they are pushed to localize. Um, that's what we're, we're really doing, like MOM. Every time I think now, especially when a company wants to extend their employment pass, you know, you want to get continue with their workers, they're asked to see if that skill set can be served by a Singaporean. And we actually have people that we will match them with. Um, MOM will look at helping them, supporting them, actually giving them grants. Um, the skill, SG United uh, mid-career package really goes to that. If you hire a Singaporean, you get benefits. So that's what we've been trying to do. But again, um, it is really the inertia and the um, um, fear of the companies. And, and that's something we need to help and continue to work on. Um, I just wanted to kind of respond to um, Lewis's point. Um, he raised a very good point in, in Parliament about tracking um, the percentages of our um, yes. uh, the um, what do you call it senior the portion roles of, the proportion of, of the senior roles. And the I think it's a, a fair it's point a and it's level. something that we need to look at but I just wanted to highlight I think Minister Ong responded to that question and I think he alluded to the fact that yes um, we, we shouldn't just look at percentages because um, the, while the share remains stable, the absolute numbers of Singaporeans holding senior positions have actually been growing at a healthy pace as the base has expanded. So I think in 2,600 Singaporeans now hold such position, 900 more than five years ago. And that means an increase of 50% in absolute numbers. So okay. I think while we're tracking this, I think we should also be fair and actually look at what actually is really happening. But I acknowledge the points raised by Lewis and Francis, and I think these are things that the, comp uh, the government is very aware of, and we're working with companies to keep improving this. Okay. To the audience, just bear with me. Let's give this uh, issue of uh, labour uh, just a few more minutes, maybe till 5.15, 5.20. Uh, and I want to take, a, uh, in order to take a few more questions from Facebook Live. So uh, to Lewis, um, not unrelated, uh, Lewis and Francis, will minimum wage or PWM push the burden from government to businesses to bear the cost of labor, right? This is from Cheng Wei Heng. Uh, and uh, to Lewis as well, from Elena Po, taking a different tack, um, does WP intend to advocate for pay equality between the genders. And Rohayu, that might be something you might want to weigh in as well. So since we're talking about wage, labor, uh, you know, uh, could we do that? And then to uh, Francis, um, Harry Chan asks, do you think that a universal minimum wage or living wage will increase productivity by businesses? Does that, is that going to be a stick? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I think, the PAP side may also feel that uh, may want to comment on whether that might be a real spur to businesses to kind of um, um, want to get productivity out of uh, labor because you're going to have to pay a, very, um, a reserve price. And I guess the debate is where that reserve price should be set. If it's high enough, it'd be a spur. If it's low enough, it doesn't do anything for workers anyway. So um, just one more round of questions, if you don't mind. Kick off with uh, uh, Lewis. Yeah, this fighting for minimum wage, isn't it? Passing the buck to businesses. Uh, I guess the uh, questioner is thinking that it's really the government has to um, support the system in some way. Thanks for the question and thanks, Gillian. So I think firstly on the issue of the minimum wage, um, I think it's one where, you know, it's not just talking about passing the buck to SMEs or corporates. I think at the same time, we also recognize and have also pushed for some of these ideas in our manifesto on how we can better support SMEs in terms of, um, you know, supporting them either through uh, Exim Bank, um, rent measures, and it's also about how, I think I've mentioned about these um, in, in one of my earlier speeches as well. You know, if we think about the resources of the government and, and, uh, and basically of the country as a whole versus the resources of a company and, and that of an individual, um, it is important for us to save for a rainy day, ensure that we manage our reserves prudently. But the end result would be that perhaps, you know, if, what do we do with the reserves? 
you know, they are being invested by our investment companies, uh, whether it's um, GIC, Pemasic Holdings. And if you look at GIC, for example, their mandate is to invest outside of Singapore. And if you think about, you know, perhaps can there be more that's being done to invest in our own people, our own corporates, uh, to ensure that we are able to be more productive in the global arena? I think we also need to recognize that our SMEs, um, I think Francis has mentioned about this. I think our SMEs form the backbone um, to our economy. I think that's about 50, close to about 50% or so of the um, overall firms, but actually 70 odd percent of employment. So we need to continue to support the um, companies themselves. But at the same time, the idea of the minimum wage is basically to ensure that um, you know, in, in this day and age, no one gets left behind. We all are able to get by and ensure that we meet basic needs. I think that's how we derive our minimum wage as well in terms of the uh, figures on the average household expenditure on basic needs. Um, so to ensure that Singaporeans are not, um, are, are not neglected, are well looked after. Uh, on the second question in terms of gender equality, again, uh, if I would like to draw back to our manifesto, again, that's something that we strongly believe in. Um, in fact, I think it's one of our points whereby we actually want um, companies to proactively report to say the MOM in terms of the gender pay gap for equivalent jobs. Uh, this is one of the points that we raised. And on top of just wages in itself, it is also about the um, whole holistic um, set of other um, pointers and, and measures. I think um, if you look at say, you know, I, I'm a new parent, for example, uh, I've got a one year old boy. Um, if you look at par um, parental leave, for example, you have progressive companies. Um, they are even based in Singapore that do not have a distinction between paternal leave and maternal leave. Um, in fact, I know of um, a friend who is working in an American firm. I think as a father, he gets the same amount of uh, leave as um, his wife um, in terms of parental leave. And perhaps that is something that we can do more to address um, the burden of um, you know, looking after a child. Now, I wouldn't say burden, but share in the joys of parenthood, I would say. Um, and I think it's not just about wages, but ensure that um, you know, there is equality across some of these other dimensions as well. Thank you, Louis. Over to you, Francis. Yeah, your your. <laughs> so the um, <clears throat> the question of minimum wage and the universal uh, minimum living wage, whether it affect... increase productivity for businesses. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I, uh, again, uh, I, I share my own example to you when I was when we were hiring people. The first thing uh, we will ask the HR director will look at all this job. What is the median wage in the market, and we pay above that. Not that the company is rich or we are lavish. It's simply because you want the best to come and join you. At the same time, they're all motivated to join you. And so you have to pay higher wage. Then how do you do it? Save on other part productivity and use other means to compensate for the higher wage cost that you have to pay. Because it pays to have very motivated employees and people will come and feel that you are taking care of them. So back to even SME, small companies, if they have to pay the minimum wage, basically, it would actually help to drive them to look for productivity to compensate for that. Okay, and if these SME are employing vast number of employees below minimum wage, then they're in the low, high, high labor intensive, low cost labor kind of industry. And I would question, do we want to proliferate our economy with such companies? And when we want to move upstream to higher productivity, higher level companies, and the government should help them. So it's very fundamental philosophy. And we can't just make a, wise, a, a broad statement and say that minimum wage will cause all company to, to suffer and it, it's, it's going to uh, pass the buck to them. No, I don't okay. believe so. Okay, then on the second one, gender pay gap, any points of view before we- oh, Sorry, what is that again? Do you have anything else to say on uh, gender pay gap though, before we pass the time to Rahayu? Oh, uh, that shouldn't be. I mean, logically speaking, if this is the, the job done by a particular person, whether it's a male or female, it should be the same. Uh, yeah. Same, same pay. Why would we want to discriminate between a, a male and a female employee? Mm -hmm. right? Okay, thank you. So over to Rahayu. 
uh, yeah, minimum wage yeah. might be a spur actually, uh, and address the inertia that you were discussing. So I think uh, uh, there's um, somewhere we can uh, so have a good debate. I think this uh, issue of minimum wage, as um, Louis had pointed out, <laughs> was debated at nauseum in Parliament, and um, I think continues to be a matter that is. Um, uh, being talked about by Singaporeans, something they're interested in. I just wanted to highlight a point that um, SMS Kopo Kun highlighted in his response, in his speech. Um, he actually explained that what WP wants to achieve in the proposed minimum wage of 1,300, actually we have already achieved through um, the progressive wage model. Um, and we've always said that we're not opposed to the uh, minimum wage concept, but ours is a minimum wage plus, and that plus is important. I just I suppose I want to highlight the context that actually 98.3% of our workforce are already earning more than $1,300 a month. So only about 32,000 across a variety of job roles earn less than $1,300. And they represent 1.7% of our local workforce. So if we want to talk about drawing that line at that number, I think we really need to think again, because um, as we've already highlighted, and as the um, uh, participants have asked and questioned, how will this impact businesses? Will it hurt them? Um, will it cause um, stagnation of salaries? You know, um, so there's there's a few issues that I think we need to carefully unpack, and and hence the um, minimum wage argument is something that I think we really need to have people understand its nuances and actually look at what the government is already doing. I think the key issue should be on how we ensure that there is a sustainable way of making sure that those who are in the low income brackets continue to keep earning. So it's a function of making sure that they have enough income, but that their skills also increase so that they match you know, the growth of that job and can earn better. So mm -hmm. that's what we're looking at and we're talking about progressive wage model. It's also about the skills. So we're not just killing the businesses, just making them pay, but making sure that there's more to offer. So yeah. this is where the party stands on, on progressive wage model. With regards to the gender wage gap, clearly, this is something that uh, we need to think about. I think it's not as straightforward um, and not so easy as legislating or um, you know, um, uh, in forcing companies to do so a certain way. Um, there's various reasons. We know of the um, motherhood penalty that women pay, right? When they go out of work, when they have they take maternity leave and all that. And that accounts for some of the uh, differences in wages that women have over time. The numbers that we're looking at, fortunately in Singapore, is about 6% um, adjusted. Um, and, and I think that's something not too bad, but I think we definitely need to keep closing. Um, this is not just about... Um, setting rules or legislation in place, but we need to understand the whole dynamics of how the works, the workings of businesses and how we can encourage um, companies to be more open. And that's why the conversations on women development go to the core. We're not just talking about legislations, but we're talking about changing mindsets, re-looking at how work can be seen. It can be flexible work. It's just about product productivity, right? It's about what you deliver. Okay. And about um, the different gender um, uh, stereotypes that we've been giving women and men in terms of caregiving roles and all that. So, um, and I'm sure Louis, you know, as a young father will be one who is <laughs> actively feeding his child in the, in the night, not just leaving his wife to do so. And we're seeing a lot more fathers do that. So I think the time is right for this kind yeah. of conversations and yeah. we should definitely build on this. Okay. So let me ask a purely political question. Uh, I think we've all talked about um, the debate that has been had on uh, um, minimum wage versus progressive wage model. Um, clearly with uh, three parties in parliament, you have the contestation of ideas. Um, and I wanna acknowledge that Lewis had said uh, at the start that uh, the, the WP is trying to offer minimum wage in, to complement PWM where it's not been introduced yet. So the purely political question is with this contestation of ideas, what is your assessment? Is it a, a productive contest of ideas? Are we progressing the issue? Uh, how, how is it benefiting Singaporeans or is this just political play? To me, <laughs> that's Anyone. something everybody can answer. How, how even has this conversation thus far to 520 uh, felt like? Uh, I mean, do we feel that um, it's, we've made some progress on the issues. Yeah. So how does the contestation of ideas serve Singaporeans? Over to you. 
Conceptually, clearly, contestation encourages uh, more robust solutions um, and benefits the country as a whole. And I think we want to continue doing this, but it has to go down to the granularity and the resolution of each item. So mm -hmm. I think facts need to be looked at. I think we need to actually um, really unpack the situation and then come to a certain point where you don't just keep pushing the ideology, but really how does that work in the context? So, I mean, I'll just give a general answer. I think we continue to debate on a lot of things and on, at, on some occasions, um, we actually say that, um, yes, this is something we can take back and consider in our discussions, um, but there are some occasions where principally it um, is challenging to implement or where, you know, we're already looking at other solutions. So, um, this is something that I think um, we need to continue to have that tussle on and, um, you know, to, to continue finding it, that Singaporean way of uh, debating, but yes. constructively so that we don't, just now. Just, you know, yeah, just keep talking about it, but we need to move on and actually then um, really implement things that will actually benefit Singaporeans. Okay. Louis, what about you? You put yeah. out the olive leaf just now, not either <laughs> or, but and. So over to you. Yes, I think, thank, thanks for highlighting that, Julian. And again, um, I would like to state that look, we are not against the, um, the the progressive wage model as a diametrically opposed concept. Um, you know, if you think about the PWM, it has taken us about eight years to roll it out to three sectors, and probably that there are two more sectors that are coming on board. I think there's one uh, that's coming on in 2022. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a lift one, um, but basically, you know, if we are looking at this 32,000 or so people. Um, you know, why can't we just introduce a minimum wage and continue to work on the um, progressive wage model? I think um, that's really our point here because um, you know, it is people's lives and livelihoods at the end of the day. So over um, the but I think purely political question, so is this contestation of ideas productive or not? So I think the, as we have seen just from one particular issue, the minimum wage, I think it has generated a lot of... Uh, uh, debate and not just within parliament itself, but basically in, in the broader Singapore society. And I think that, you know, if we continue to have such conversations, um, I think it is actually to the benefit of, of uh, Singapore, for Singapore and Singapore's future, because at the end of the day, it is our lives as, as Singaporeans after all. And it is definitely heartening to see that a lot of people take a very proactive um, uh, stance towards, um, you know, finding out um, and understanding the various issues of the day um, and how best they can participate and, and, and contribute ideas. I, I think these are things which are positive. Um, and I think the, uh, the robust contestation of ideas, constructive debate, I will agree with Raha you there that, that these are good things. And which brings me to another point which I mentioned um, in, in one of the earlier questions as well. We need to have evidence-based, fact-based conversations. Mm -hmm. um, again, agree with Raha you there. But um, if you look at some other countries, for example, in Australia, there is the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and whereas in this part here in Singapore, oftentimes if you look at the parliamentary questions that are being filed by uh, parliamentarians, it is about requesting for data. Um, and so perhaps if there could be a basically better access to data for, for not just parliamentarians, but society as a whole. You know, we have uh, data.gov.sg that is, uh, you know, one source of data. But if more data can be provided to, uh, you know, the general public, um, the academics, um, basically it's, it's also about crowdsourcing this uh, idea generation. And perhaps there may be something that uh, the government, the Workers' Party, um, or any of the parliamentarians may have missed out, but could be picked up upon or discovered by, um, say, somebody else in the general public. And um, basically, it allows us to cover our blind spots to enable us to basically build better fact-based, evidence-based policies going forward. All right. Over to you, Francis, the purely political question. Does this contestation of ideas serve anyone? Yeah, I think definitely we strongly believe in contestation ideas. It's good good for, for the country, it's, it's good uh, value in terms of really coming up with uh, uh, alternate ideas. And, uh, and I fully agree with Lewis, is at the end of the day, it's really about access to information because if you don't have the right information, you can't even formulate the problem. 
let alone getting ideas. So if you have this information available, both inside and outside parliament, of course, albeit that some information could be sensitive or whatever it takes to get it to the people, then we would be better off in terms of a, a, a wider spread of ideas uh, that surface out and people can be much more enlightened as to the cause of the problem, the possible solution, mm -hmm. what, how to handle it. And back to this uh, minimum wage or minimum living wage, I mean, you can look at it as a political question. You can look at it just basically as a practical question. You're thinking about 32,000 people, 1.7%. I mean, one solution is just, if you strongly believe it hurts the company, this is the government just help this 32,000 people, all right? Why don't you just directly give aid to them, help them and lift them up above the 1,003? Okay, but uh, actually the government does have the welfare scheme, so uh, it is already providing income support. Uh, I think that seems to not uh, be viewed as part of the equation right now in discussing minimum wage. So um, I, I don't know if uh, that helps at all, Francis. So that's, that calls for more debate and ideas with, with more granular information as well. How the thing comes about, right? I mean, there are always different solutions to it. And the good, at the end of the day, it's all about trade off, too. Okay. Right? You can't have a perfect solution. All right. Julian, could I just make two responses? <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, I think one on the issue of discussions and debates. Um, yes, you know, we want this, this discussion, but we've also seen how it's like in other countries um, and how it creates. At in, on, on occasions, polarity, lobbying of a certain cause, which can impede the movement of a meaningful implementation of policies and schemes. So I think this is just something we have to guard against. I don't think we uh, want to stop ourselves from doing it just because we're afraid, but I think we need to be very conscious at the back of our minds, the impact it can have on society. Yeah. Okay. On, the, on the issue of information, again, learning from other countries, I think the issue is not so much about just having information, but the interpretation of that information Honestly, with the internet, you know, with the access, um, the government is trying our very best actually to make sure we get that information out there. It has to be meaningful information, something that people can actually uh, really work on and understand because we do want people to understand why we have to make certain decisions, why there are certain trade-offs. Um, and I, I think that's work in progress. Um, I don't think we're close to the idea of how we can make this um, happen for people to have that knowledge and information, but it has to be in a meaningful manner and not a free for all where, you know, you end up having, you know, just loose information out there and people interpreting it and just causing a lot of buzz without actually meaningfully changing policies that will okay. help and benefit Singaporeans. All right. I'm going to cast a few, uh, you know, I think we really have to go really quickly. We have about 15 minutes left. So let me just start uh, uh, with uh, PSP. There, there's a set of questions. Uh, Eva Tan wants to know, Mr. Francis Yuan, who will be the face of the PSP after Dr. Tan is gone? Um, Elena Po asks, are you going to give more leadership roles to young women in the PSP? So now let's just get not go past the policy and then get into the... Uh, uh, you know, party issues, right? PSP, over to you. Is PSP more than Dr. Tan? And yes. where will the women be? Yeah, I think we are also looking at this question very seriously. In terms very of, impolite question, by the way. No, I, I think it's a fair yeah. question too. Basically, I th the answer is that it will not be one face. It will be many faces of PSP. So, you know, PSP must go beyond just one person. And Dr. Tan himself acknowledges that. And his and our, the, this leadership uh, intention is to create the next generation of leaders and we present them to the public and let them scrutinize these leaders, the work they do on the ground and the ideas they articulate. And our vision is to make sure that there is a bunch of people, not just one person. I don't think a good party survive on just one person. It must survive on values and survive on process and survive on basic principle. Okay, you're number two. Who's number two A, B, C, D, and E? Number two. In terms you're of number two. So who else do you have in line who's uh, going up the ranks? Now, those you see are, are public figures now. I mean, the Manwai, the Hazel, I mean, these are all givens. And then you've got the uh, leaders in the youth wing and uh, in, in the women's wing, probably you can Google them now. Okay. Um, there are quite a number uh, that we are. And as we speak, uh, today, during lunch, we are, we are meeting young people who are talented and we are talking to them and uh, helping to 
uh, as, uh, phantom their aspiration and maybe to, uh, to groom them uh, um, uh, through various ways and to train them as well. Okay. Um, we may see very different people even in uh, a year's time. So uh, at the end of the day, we just hope more fresh faces can uh, be surfaced uh, to the public. But okay. let me say that really is not going to be, is, is the, the plan is not going to be a one person succeeding. Uh, Dr. Tan is a group of people that can continue to carry their platform. Okay, so you're saying that leadership succession is top of your consciousness in yes. the party. Yes. Right. Uh, over to Lewis, you actually mentioned uh, the role that the retired uh, WP leaders played in the campaign and you thanked them just now. What can you say about leadership succession in WP? Granted that you have just been through that process, Mr. Pritam Singh is your Secretary General and also because of the performance uh, in GE 2020, he's with 10 uh, WP members in Parliament, he has been designated Leader of the Opposition. Uh, what can you tell us about the process of leadership succession that you might be planning in WP over the next three to four years? Mm. So I think leadership succession, I think is not a destination. Um, it is part of a continuous journey that we are constantly walking. Um, and again, it brings us back to the point about how for the Workers' Party, we are a volunteer-driven organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also strongly believe in walking the talk, being on the ground. So through our constant engagement um, with our volunteers, with the rest of the party members, it is a constant process of um, you know, giving people opportunities to develop um, within the party. And in a way, we also have a unique opportunity in the um, office of the leader of the opposition. Um, I think this is something which we will continue to build on in terms of um, give, you know, giving uh, more people the opportunity um, to, to actually contribute. And I think it does give us the, um, give Singapore rather, the opportunity to institutionalize an opposition in parliament and in our political system. So I think these are things which we'll continue to build on and okay. to continue to engage with our uh, party members and volunteers. Thank you, Louis. Rohayu, your party is gearing up for its next party conference in early November. Uh, can you say something about how, uh, you know, um, the development of talent is going on in the PAP? Earlier on in the forum, there was a question posed to you. Uh, it's been taken off on my file right now. But uh, the question was posed as to how uh, you are going to, in your internal assessment, uh, uh, refine your candidate selection process. Um, I think that was an issue that uh, arose very early in the uh, hustings. And I think that uh, I'd like to invite you to address that question that was uh, posed um, early on in the forum, but also, uh, yeah, talent development in the PAP, please. Given that you're a national movement and you have to really be fielding people right across the country, yeah. I think we've been very open with our processes. I mean, it's an open secret how we go about doing it in terms of our engagement with um, many different people from different sectors. If there's anything to go by, the recent slate in the last GE 2020, I think, was a reflection of the diversity we were looking at uh, with um, the... Um, now members of parliament um, and then um, candidates who are from different backgrounds um, with different um, experiences, different age groups, different gender. And I think we are constantly on the lookout um, for uh, people who um, believes in our values and um, want to serve. Um, it is not an easy um, thing to do, as Lewis would tell you and even Francis would tell you, to actually be involved in politics. It takes a lot um, out of that person and individual. And it's a very challenging experience. Um, I think um, especially leading up to candidacy and um, even then doing the MP's work, I I've really feel very uh, strongly for those who have actually put up their hands and put themselves in such a vulnerable situation to be scrutinized and to be looked at um, at people. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a lot of things when we, we do our process of actually getting candidates, we'll do the usual things. We'll, we'll look at um, what they've been involved in. We're trying to get the um, best in the team. We want to get those who um, are aligned to our mission or values. Um, and a lot of times that comes across to meetings, through discussions. 
Okay. Um, at times, things that happen in our past, I think it, it, it is the same for all candidates, for all parties, right? Um, comes back to haunt us. And that's something that I think um, we need to really um, understand and appreciate the limitations of some of the processes that we have in place. Yeah, because but, I think, uh, Rohayu, you will have felt firsthand uh, the effects of, uh, um, you know, perhaps uh, last minute surprises and uh, not knowing what, yeah, the, how the ground will actually uh, respond and react. So are there any thoughts about improving that process, given that you were in, you were, of course, part of the Jurong GRC team and uh, you saw a last minute change in uh, candidates. Um, so, you know, I think this is particularly, uh, you know, I suppose, point me to you, <laughs> uh, you know, to have to see a, a change in the team members uh, then, yeah. Anything yeah. further you want to say? So if I, as I've said, um, really the processes, we do our best to really put people up, but we, we realise that uh, the society, public, has certain other norms and values that they would judge candidates upon. Right. And that's something that remains open, right? Whoever we put up, there will be that kind of um, uh, challenge and there will be that kind of um, uh, vulnerability that the candidate will be exposed to. So that's something that we will need to definitely review, keep uh, looking at um, and improving. But really, at the end of the day, I, I would just want to say that um, I think I would call for a lot more... Um, um, uh, value placed in the uh, what that candidate can give, can offer. Um, and uh, I think that's something that we would continue to look, look upon and uh, look at. Um, and we will have to really um, do our best to get the best candidates. Um, you know, we are always expected to be whiter than white. Um, and that's not always um, so straightforward. And so that's something that we will need to continue building on within our party. Okay, I'm conscious that we're down to the last four minutes. So let me pick up on Melvin Yu's question. Uh, this is really zooming out and it's a big picture, tying policy with party. Uh, his question is maybe all three parties here can share what's their vision for Singapore. What do you envision for our future generation? Uh, and if I can tack on the, on the end, how do you see Singapore relating or keeping its ties with its global networks? Because Singapore is not just Singapore, it's on its own, an island on its own. So within uh, your quick closing statements about the vision thing, what is your vision for Singapore for the future and how does its place in the world tie into that? Um, and I think we'll have to wrap. So can we do this in reverse order if you don't mind? Uh, uh, please, uh, Francis, kick us off, and then uh, Louis, share your your vision for Singapore, uh, and then Rohayu, you, uh, you'll have, um, yeah, you go third. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for letting me uh, kick it off. Uh, <clears throat> I, I did share the slide, it's not the vision, but just to re re emphasize very quickly, really PSPC, our vision for Singapore is building a strong and united Singapore based on the tenet of our pledge, but with this emphasis of being compassionate, making compassion our value, making so-called success not just based on material success, making prosperity something that is shared with everybody in an equitable way, and at the same time with freedom of expression and diversity of ideas, okay, meritocracy and strength of governance. So, and ultimately it's the interest of the people that must come foremost. And on the so-called international networking, I think we are living in a world of changing geopolitics. You know, the rise of China, the, the, the struggle between the dominance of China and the United States. As and well as the for, current pandemic. And the current pandemic. And also not forgetting that the countries around us are moving up very fast up the ladder too. You know, they are no longer the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, or Vietnam or Thailand of the past. There will be competition, contests, and we are living in an environment that we have to really rethink, think out of the box, think of blue ocean idea for the country, because it's not going to be more of the same that will work. So this vision is one that hopefully drive us to work together as one people to be very mindful that times are changing. We just cannot afford to squander away good talent and ideas uh, among our people to come forward to serve the country. And for us, as PSP, a round of so-called soundbite. We want to be a party of choice so that people want to vote for us 
because they want us, not because we are by default, not a default party, meaning that if they're angry with the ruling party, they vote us. We want them to vote us, let they choose us, and they choose a handphone. This brand is what they want because we resonate with them. It gives us, give them confidence that we can deliver the vision that I just articulated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis. Over to you, Louis. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of our vision for Singapore, it's really one where, you know, all Singaporeans must be uh, you know, enabled to help them achieve their dreams that regardless of your background, um, we must give them the right tools and, and, and levers to enable them to fulfill their full potential. Um, this is on the individual level, but at the same time, you know, linking to your point about the uh, Singapore's place in the global economy, you know, we need to ensure that uh, we continue to have that economic dynamism, um, that our local firms, um, we, our local MNCs, our local SMEs, they are again given the full support to compete with um, the peers overseas um, and basically ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, we have robust um, governance and institutions in place to ensure that um, we take Singapore forward. And to me, it really starts with Parliament and then the tone that we set in Parliament as well. Um, you know, we do believe in having a responsible opposition in Parliament to ensure that there is that constant uh, contestation of ideas, that we have robust constructive debates on how to take Singapore forward. Because at the end of the day, it is about, you know, your lives, our lives, our lives as Singaporeans, and we need to have a Singapore for all. And that, and that is really at the end of the day, what we want to achieve, you know, to, to achieve the best outcomes for all Singaporeans in Singapore. Thank you for that ambition, Louis. Uh, over to you, Rahayu. Thank you, Jillian. Um, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you as well as the panel members for such a, a robust discussion. And I think that really uh, gives a glimpse as to my vision for Singapore, a platform or a place where we could have meaningful, constructive discussions and debates um, for the betterment of the country to benefit our people. Um, and I think we have seen how that could really happen in other places where debates can get nasty, where it then comes in place of progress for the people. Um, and I would really hope that when we grow politically, socially, we mature um, meaningfully and uh, we actually um, do it our way, the Singapore way, respectfully, um, and coming up with a solution uh, that actually meets the needs of many. Um, I think internationally, it is something that we've continued to um, work on and uh, we will definitely have challenges in times like this um, where it exposes our vulnerability in COVID-19 really pushes us to shift and pivot um, and it takes a lot from our people or businesses but I hope people can show resilience and strength and yet again you know um, emerge out of that stronger um, mm -hmm. so that's my wish and my vision for Singapore. Thank you so much for sharing that and I think uh, I'll, my I hope the viewers this afternoon will join me in feeling that we're heartened uh, that uh, we have politicians who do put Singapore and Singaporeans first. We uh, wish you all the best in uh, the parliamentary term ahead and that you will be true to your uh, desire to see constructive engagement and uh, that uh, there will be better solutions, uh, especially policy-wise, for uh, our Singaporeans, especially we go, as we go through this crisis of a generation. I'm sure my audience will join me in saying that we are proud that Singapore is part of the COVAX team uh, at this time that you have not be left behind the international community. And while it serves our interest to be part of uh, uh, the group that desires to see not just the development of a good vaccine, safe and effective for uh, Singaporeans, but the global community, that we also commit ourselves to the hard work of ensuring that there is fair distribution of that vaccine uh, across the globe, especially to those who are in dire need, in, as well as the frontliners. So let me uh, wish on behalf of IPS and I think our audience, all the very best to all of you and your respective parties. And uh, to the audience, thank you for your questions and comments for uh, contributing to a lively forum this evening. And I, I wish you a very good evening and a, um, take care.